As I sit here editing this podcast about Brexit, events in the UK are in motion. The headlines say that Boris Johnson and the EU have agreed on a tentative Brexit deal, and now Johnson is racing to secure support for the pact in Parliament. As I race to finish this editing before my podcast deadline, uh, forces in the UK are racing against the Brexit deadline. Hopefully there will still be enough interesting discussion in this episode that despite what happens the next few days and weeks, our audience will still find this episode worth a listen. In addition to a discussion of Brexit with our special guest, Chris Gilligan from the UK, this podcast also features a discussion between myself and Andrew Kleiman about a recent online debate about the infamous Ukraine call whistleblower. You are listening to Radio Free Humanity, the Marxist humanist podcast. My name is Brandon Cooney. And I'm Andrew Kleiman. To hear more episodes, read more about the issues discussed here, or to join the conversation, please visit MarxistHumanistInitiative.org. In this episode, we'll be talking about Brexit and all things Brexit with our special guest, Chris Gilligan of the UK. Also in the current events section of the podcast, Andrew Kleiman and I will be discussing a recent online dust-up around uh, some questions about the Ukraine call whistleblower. While our podcast is sponsored by Marxist Humanist Initiative, the views expressed by co-hosts and guests of Radio Free Humanity are their own. They do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of Marxist Humanist Initiative. So for the current events section of today's podcast, we're going to be discussing a piece by Matt Taibbi in Rolling Stone that came out on October 6th, in which Matt Taibbi questions the motives of the now famous Ukraine call whistleblower. That piece by Matt Taibbi was entitled, The Whistleblower Probably Isn't, and it was responded to three days later in The Atlantic magazine with a piece by Adam Serwer entitled, So What If The Whistleblower Has A Political Motive? And a few days after that, in Salon, um, Andrew O'Hara responded with a piece called, Donald Trump is a criminal and impeachment is a murky, amoral struggle. Both these things are true. So before we bring you the main segment of today's podcast, we will be discussing this little controversy around Matt Taibbi's piece. So the main gist of Matt Taibbi's piece goes like this. It's a conspiracy piece meant to cast doubt on the whistleblower. He doesn't discuss the actual evidence regarding Trump's Ukraine call. Instead, the piece tries to cast doubt on the motives of the whistleblower. It proceeds through a series of open-ended questions by which he tries to cast doubt on the idea that the whistleblower is a lone wolf. He also contrasts the Ukraine whistleblower with those he calls real whistleblowers, people like Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning. And he says that real whistleblowers, you can tell they're real because they get persecuted by the state and disrespected in the media. Therefore, the fact that this whistleblower is being protected and is being respected by the media suggests that it is probably more than one person and that it's probably actually what he calls a palace coup. He suggests that the whistleblower and therefore the entire impeachment inquiry and therefore all those who support impeachment are just all part of a project to restore the political centrist to power, the neoliberals to power. Then he, he, he finishes by saying the argument wherein people are celebrating the whistleblower, defending the whistleblower, that's based on the presumption that Trump is clearly worse than the people opposing him. Um, and Taibbi is not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. So a few days later, Adam Sewer in The Atlantic responds with his piece. He says, look, we don't even need the whistleblower complaint anymore because we have the call transcript that proves that this happened, and Trump has admitted in public that it's happened. So this whole question of the whistleblower as mo- motives is a total distraction, and Matt Taibbi doesn't, isn't even talking about the actual crime and what should be the consequences of the crime, but is just narrowly focused on this question of the motives of the whistleblower, which is a total distraction. And in response to Matt Taibbi's long uh, discussion about what makes a whistleblower an authentic whistleblower, uh, Seward just dismisses this pretty quickly, saying, look, uh, you know, I guess the whistleblower isn't punk enough for Matt Taibbi. But in reality, the whistleblower falls into the actual legal category of whistleblower. And look, not all whistleblowers in history have had um, pure motives. Uh, the Deep Throat had a vendetta against Nixon, but this was still an important whistleblower. 
But the motives aren't really the important question when it comes to whistleblowers. And then, th- then Serber gets into a really interesting issue for me, which is he talks about the strange occasional convergence between Trump sycophants and the anti-anti-Trump left. That is to say, the people on the left, they're opposed to those of us who are anti-Trump. And that what this anti-anti-Trump left does can devolve into what he says uh, is the reactionary assumption that everything liberal support is worth opposing. So he's seen kind of like a knee-jerk uh, opposition to the uh, to liberals uh, taking place here. And he also makes this point that, look, if you're really concerned about the overreaching power of the intelligence community, which we should be concerned about, you should also be concerned about the unchecked power of the Trump administration and want to do something about that as well. And then finally, we have Adam O'Hara's piece in Salon, which as far as I can tell, just wants to uh, push the same line as Matt Taibbi, but he's, he's sort of trying to clean up after Taibbi's mess because there's so much sloppy argumentation in the Taibbi piece. His only main point, that is Adam O'Hara's only main point, seems to be one of whataboutism. He says, you know, look, other presidents... And the intelligence community have done so many anti-democratic things, meddling in other people's elections. They've been doing illegal things for their whole careers. So we can't really trust the whistleblower from the CIA. And we can't be on on the side of all those liberals who ignored all these things for so long. I mean, the one thing I would would stress maybe you didn't about O'Hara's piece is he says, look, going after Trump over the Ukraine thing, this is not about democracy. This is, quote, an exercise in naked power politics. So it's two factions of the the elites or or whatever, which was the, the, the point that Taibbi made. So those are our summaries of the three pieces, which listeners, of course, can read on their own if they desire. But let's talk about what we think about them. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, reading Taibbi and reading O'Hara, one issue came to my mind that is like Serra did not mention at all. I mean, these people are going on and on about motives, you know, the malign motives of the whistleblower and the people helping them and so forth. And this is palace coup against Trump and all, all, all that, <clears throat> or, or however you, you want to put it. OK, why don't these people look at their own motives? Yeah. Right. What are the what are the motives of the anti neoliberal left here? What are the motives of the what Server calls the anti anti Trump left? I mean, it, you you either say we're talking about something where motives matter, or we're talking about something where, where they don't matter. They clearly don't matter in terms of um, the factual accuracy of the whistleblower complaint and whether Trump uh, was engaging in an abuse of power to basically try to you know enhance his ability to win the election. I mean, that the case is closed on that one. But if you want to say, you know, from a political standpoint, why is this happening? Okay, yeah, let's talk about motives. But then what are the motives of the anti-neoliberal left, the the anti-anti-Trump left here? Why are they, you know, engaging in uh, distractions as Taibbi does? You know, and why why are they coming to the defense of uh, somebody who's done that the way O'Hara does? You know, why why are they deciding in this case not to line up behind the side that is clearly just justified if, you know, you care about saving free elections, uh, you clearly want to go after Trump's abuse of power. Why are they going the other way on this? You know, what are their motives? So, I mean, if they want to talk about motives, fine, but they, they, they should, you know, look in the mirror. And it's like the total absence of the question of truth in the whole conversation, the reduction of the whole conversation to the issue of motives to the power politics at play, to an analysis of political factions, it reduces the whole conversation to one of how to grab power without any discussion of any principles to fight for, like fighting for the rule of law or democracy. And there's all this mass support for anti-Trumpist politics and for impeachment, but these leftists, and, and these are leftists which like to fantasize about leading the masses, but they can't even recognize or don't want to recognize or see actual popular movements to overthrow a president and instead want to reduce everything to palace intrigues and say that everything is just a matter of centrist trying to reclaim power. I would take it a step further. I mean, this is clearly um, an instance of what Marxist Humanist Initiative has termed uh, left-first politics. 
where the interests of the left take precedence over kind of like whether there's a free and fair election in 2020 or not. Um, but I would say it's not that they, they don't understand, you know, an independent movement uh, and its interests that don't exactly dovetail with their own. They th These are people who think that, that they need to run things, you know, uh, to get the outcomes that, that they want. Um, yeah, the anti-neoliberal left, the Social Democrats, are having a really hard time trying to figure out how to deal with this impeachment issue and anti-Trumpism in general, because it doesn't fit into their politics of winning the masses to their side with social democratic programs. And you know, that might be a good pivot to talk about a recent article in Jacobin called Looking at Impeachment from the Left. This is a conversation between Samuel Moyne and Max Sawicki. And the subtitle asks the questions for the conversation. It says, how should the left view the impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump? Are they a political opportunity or a distraction from the issues that leftists care about? End quote. The whole thing is framed and oriented around this question of what is good for the left and the interests of the left, not what is good for the struggle for democracy, the struggle of those who are fighting against the oppression and brutality of Trumpism, not <clears throat> um, the struggle for the rule, the rule of law and against proto-fascism, but what is good for our interests as a left that wants to lead. So Wiki, who's in favor of the impeachment proceedings, says, the question for me is how to build the left and what are the main priorities of the left and how do we advance them? Okay. And then the so-called other side is uh, Samuel Moyne. And he says, there's such momentum that has built up now after the dam broke about the Ukrainian call um, that it seems to some people that it'd be foolish for the left not to be involved and not to try to put its stamp on the results. Okay. But he says, I'm just not sure how it's going to happen that the left or progressives can own the impeachment proceedings. So like if we if we don't own it, then, you know, the hell with it. And, you know, they just sound more and more each day like the, the right wing of the, the Democratic Party. Well, there you have it right in Jacobin. It's like the left first smoking gun. Yeah. It's, it's, like, you, it's like the... It's like, it's like, it's like, like the, it's like the, the Jacobin version of the, the Trump call transcripts. Yeah. It's like... <laughs> It's like they said it right there. We don't need any, don't need to speculate anymore. It's like just right there in the open. Yeah, you know. Okay, so you can ha you can have your 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 impeachment inquiry, but we have a favor to ask though. Yeah. yeah. Can you make it social democratic. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Chris Gilligan is a veteran migrant rights activist who grew up in Northern Ireland and is currently based in Scotland. He's the author of Northern Ireland and the Crisis of Anti-Racism. He is the author of a number of articles on Brexit, which have been published in With Sober Senses, the online journal of Marxist Humanist Initiative, as well as writings in Insurgent Notes, Hard Crackers, Rosa Luxemburg Institute, Brexit Blog, and Open Democracy. And... He is today's guest on Radio Free Humanity. Chris Gilligan, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, it seems like every time I hear anyone talking about Brexit, there's this obligatory review session where we make sure everyone's on the same page about the fundamentals. Maybe we should start with that first. You know, I've been watching the Brexit disaster unfold for how many years has it been now? Three? It's since 2006, yeah. So in three years, has anything changed? Are we still just dealing with the same question and the same problems? What are, can you lay out for us, the fundamental issues still at stake right now? Let's, I'll just start by saying that there's basically three options on the table. In the referendum, the majority of those people who voted, voted to leave the EU. The main political parties, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, have said that they, they will abide by that uh, decision. And that means that the UK is, uh, is supposed to be leaving the European Union. Um, there's two ways that the UK can leave the European Union. One is through some kind of negotiated deal with the EU, which is what uh, Boris Johnson is trying to do now, what his predecessor Theresa May did, which is to come to some agreement with the EU about the basic principles that will uh, guide future relationship between the UK and the EU. And then there's a will be a period, a, a transition period uh, after the UK leaves the EU in order to uh, get from where things are currently to a, a final a arranged relationship with the EU. The UK 
its largest trading partner is the EU, so it's in the interests of UK business to have some negotiated exit if there is going to be an exit from the EU. So that's one form. Um, Theresa May negotiated a deal which Parliament didn't accept. And now Boris Johnson is holding in one hand the threat of no deal and in the other uh, trying to negotiate a different deal from the one that uh, Theresa May negotiated. No deal will mean that the UK will leave the EU and have no arrangements in place. So no trading arrangements in place, uh, which means that everything that now currently comes across the borders uh, of the UK and and the EU uh, that doesn't need to have uh, any checks, everything will need to be checked and um, and certified going both ways from the UK into the EU and from the EU into the UK. And there's real concern that that will create major problems. So those are the two leaving options. But there is also the option to remain within the EU. And there is a um, constituency within Parliament. There's a constituency in the country. In fact, the opinion polls suggest that consistently, almost since the the vote in 2016, a majority of people are in favour of the UK remaining in the EU. There's two ways that could happen. Parliament could just simply revoke Article 50, which is the, the clause that starts the process of the UK leaving the EU. Or the other option is that there is a second referendum and if that referendum votes for the the UK to remain in the EU rather than to leave, uh, which it seems likely would happen, then the UK would remain because a majority of people would have voted for the UK to remain within the EU. So those are the the three options. Um, And in the absence of Parliament, a majority in Parliament to agree any of those three options, we've had now two uh, extensions to leave option and it's quite possible we'll have a third extension uh, at the end of this month so that's the basics of where we're at you know watching the brexit drama unfold from over here in the u.s i can't help but constantly wonder to what extent the insistence on pushing through a no deal brexit by certain people is just a result of short-term political calculations about how to further people's personal political ambitions and power and how much is actually ideologically driven and based on some real belief or theory that this is going to be good for the UK. Right. You know, it seemed like Brexit was a great thing for conservatives to advocate for when they weren't in power and weren't actually responsible for actually having to carry it through. But then once people actually get put in power and have to actually yep. carry through with it, it's like they're stuck with a hot potato and then they're just obligated to keep fighting for this thing that they never actually f- actually seriously wanted in the first place. Of course, at some point, it's always impossible to speculate about the subjective consciousness of uh, you know the rulers of capitalist states, but I wonder if you have any insight into this. No, I think you've summed it up really well. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to work out what's going on um, in terms of that, that calculation and to what extent um, the Boris Johnson is just feels like I've started this ball rolling so I just have to keep going with the ball. Um, it's certainly uh, Boris Johnson is not a committed lever. Uh, when Before the referendum, when the, the different sides were lining up on remain or leave, it wasn't a a foregone conclusion that Boris Johnson would be on the leave side. Uh, it seems to be that he made a strategic calculation that in terms of his political career, it would be better to be on the leave side. Um, I suspect that he would rather have a deal than no deal. Certainly in terms of British industry, British capital, the preferences for remain or a deal. There's little appetite for no deal. There are some people who want no deal. There are some businesses that would uh, like no deal. So uh, businesses that feel that EU regulation ties them in, um, puts constraints on them and because they want to trade internationally and don't so much with the EU. Or the kind of capitalists who make money out of chaos by betting on stocks or shares or currencies. Those are the people who uh, would like to have a a no deal or they can see something that they can get something out of no deal. But for the vast majority, uh, no deal is, is something that they look at with fear and trepidation.
Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask about this the proroguing uh, of, of Parliament some more. Uh, you've characterized what Johnson did uh, as an effort to, in your words, subvert parliamentary democracy. Um, and as I understand it, that's the gist of the Supreme Court um, ruling as well. Uh, they say you, you can't do this where we, we've got a parliament, we've got a democracy. This never happened. Um, but was this gambit by the Prime Minister Johnson, was it just like some ham-fisted political maneuvering on his part? Or is something deeper involved in this? Uh, is he, in some sense, part of the authoritarian trend that's been going on worldwide? In the U.S. with Donald Trump and Trumpism, uh, in Russia with Putin, you got Brazil, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, India, and I could go on, right? Is, is Johnson, in some sense, part of all of that? Or is he just you know, not quite a sophisticated politician. Right. So is it ham-fisted or is it authoritarian? Uh, my first thought is, can it not be both? No, it, it, can, be, it can be both, but I'm going, um, I'm going into the motivations. Sure. One of the reasons why I say can it not be both is because there are some people who I know, they don't take this idea that Donald Trump is an authoritarian because he's a fool. Um, and I, I, th I think that they're, they're not mutually exclusive, being ham fist or being a fool and being authoritarian. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. So having said that, I don't think Boris Johnson is uh, the same as Donald Trump. Uh, he certainly is in terms of uh, acting the fool. He certainly is this, uh, similar to, to Donald Trump in the way that um, he's, he's not committed to truth. He's, his career in journalism as a, an EU correspondent for the, the Daily Telegraph has been well testified that he, he made lots of things up and he wrote for, for effect often rather than uh, trying to establish the, the, the facts or understand what was going on uh, in the EU. But I think it's, the, it's not that Boris Johnson's inclination is to be authoritarian. I think it's more that um, Boris Johnson's inclination is to look out for Boris Johnson. And in doing so, he's not thinking long term in terms of the UK. And that means that um, he approaches Brexit thinking... Right, how do I um, make myself look like I am the person who's in charge here and knows what they're doing? And that that kind of showmanship that Trump does as well, the bluster, the threats, um, is there to present Boris Johnson as the person who's in control, the person who uh, is a, uh, a leader who can um, get the business done. I think that's what's going on. Um, and then in the process of doing that, he runs up against the problem of he's in a democratic society where there's checks and procedures, there's an opposition, there's parliamentary procedures, there's laws. Um, and he tries to take shortcuts or uh, push those uh, obstacles out of the way. Um, that, that's where the, the authoritarianism comes from, because it's those things that are preventing him from getting where he wants to be, rather than that, he's, that his inclination is to uh, strap on jack boots and walk across people's faces, or something like that, which is, um, I think, a, a caricature that some people on the left have. That's uh, those people who say that... What, there is no parallel between today and the 1930s. This isn't a return of fascism, um, because they they seem to think fascism or authoritarianism is is about uh, jackboots and stormtroopers, rather than um, a willingness to uh, tear up parliamentary procedure or use democ one aspect of democracy against another aspect of democracy or uh, use legal procedures to try and overturn the rule of law. Um, and that's where I think that the threats are coming from. Yeah, you know, I was struck when you were saying this just now about how similar this is to, to Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump cares about Donald Trump just in the way that Boris Johnson cares about Boris Johnson, you know, and it's not that, you know, he likes to place his uh, boots on people's necks. Uh, but the issue is that there are objective forces, certainly in the United States, that are driving Trump, you know, in a fascist direction. I'm not saying he is a fascist or anything like that, or the United States is quite a fascist fascist society yet, uh, but there are objective forces driving in that direction. Uh, and the key thing for Trump is 
Um, if he's removed from office, he can be prosecuted, um, you know, jailed, imprisoned. Uh, his businesses can be dismantled. The whole thing can come crashing down. He wants to prevent that for obvious reasons. Okay, and t- to remain in office, he needs the support of his uh, racist, xenophobic, authoritarian base. He's he's got to uh, do things that that they want. So he he's driven towards extremes, and uh, he can't get what he wants in normal democratic ways, so he has to go uh, into these authoritarian measures. It sounds to me similar to what you're saying about Johnson. Um, For some political reasons, Johnson needs to get his way, and he's willing to do what it takes to get his way. And when you're looking at a situation like that, the subjective intentions of the people running the government are not as important as the objective forces, even immediate political calculations uh, that are driving them. Uh, That's the way it seems to me. Um, I don't know. What, What are your thoughts on that? Um, about the objective forces that are driving Boris Johnson. Yeah, do you think that there are objective forces, even immediate term political calculations, that are driving him in an authoritarian direction? Uh, I, I don't think it's, we're in the same situation as the US in the sense that there isn't the same constituency in the UK that is racist, authoritarian, misogynist, in the way that you yourself have analysed in relation to Trump voters in in the US. So there isn't there isn't the same proportion in the UK. Certainly there are uh, xenophobes, certainly there are people who um, hanker after the days of empire. Um, the, there is misogyny, but it's it's not something that um, has a strong has st- strong constituency or as large a constituency in the UK. I think the logic that's uh, driving things in the UK is that there is a vote that took place where a majority of people voted to leave and the ruling class in the UK is split over that and there is a significant constituency that is in favour of leaving the EU amongst the, the public. Um, they're not all necessarily xenophobes, the, but the, there's a significant constituency there. And the, um, the vote happened. The two main parties said they would abide by the vote. And now they're kind of bound by that logic, which is tearing them apart because British capital, for the most part, is saying, no, we don't want this. Or we're willing to um, have some kind of an agreement with the, to leave the EU as long as it doesn't really uh, affect trading too much, as long as it has minimal impact on trading. But there's also the, the public are concerned about overturning the Brexit vote. So even though if there was a second referendum, it's very likely a majority would vote to remain. And there's still a majority of people who don't think that um, the the vote should be just overturned. So, for example, the Liberal Democrat Party, their official position is to revoke Article 50. They're, saying, they're not saying uh, we want a second referendum. They're just saying we should revoke Article 50, which there is definitely a constituency for that. Um, but a, a lot of people think that that's uh, anti-democratic, simply just overturning uh, what a majority of people voted for. Uh, and I'm inclined to agree with them that that, uh, that is anti-democratic. Uh, I think it's one thing to have a second referendum, and I think that would be a good thing to do. But to, um, to just overturn a popular vote without um, referencing it to the, to the electorate is anti-democratic. Um, so I think there are real contradictions and real tensions that have been stirred up by the the referendum, ones which weren't foreseen because the assumption was at the beginning that um, people would vote to remain within the EU and it would shut up uh, those Eurosceptics within the Conservative Party who've been uh, demanding a referendum for years. And that didn't happen, which is, has been a real shock. But then the logic is uh, is uh, playing itself out now. And there are real contradictions within the, the UK constitution that are just getting churned up by Brexit. And I, I think they are real contradictions. Um, it's not that... Um, one side is clearly right and the other side is clearly wrong, whether that's leave or remain. There are real contradictions on on both sides and the UK is is caught in the middle of that. And what do you mean 
that it's not the case that one side is clearly right and one is clearly wrong. Right and wrong about what? Right. So on lots of different things, right and wrong. But f- take, for example, the, the, the claim made by Leave that the EU is an undemocratic institution, that the decisions that are made by the EU are, uh, by and large, made within the, the forums of the European Union, where it's the heads of state or it's the unelected commissioners. And those heads of states or unelected commissioners are making decisions that affect the citizens of all of the EU, but those citizens don't have a direct say. That's true. The, the EU is um, undemocratic in, in those ways. Uh, the EU has evolved as a way of allowing uh, political elites in Europe to make far-reaching decisions over the heads of their electorates. And that's just, as, as I say, that's just uh, irrefutable. That's, that's true. Um, that the EU is not a, a, a very democratic way to, to run society. So, um, so there there is an argument there, um, or that the the Leave side have that I um, I, do, I agree with. But the there's many on the Leave side who then uphold the referendum and say the the referendum result a majority of people voted to leave the EU. Therefore, uh, if we don't leave the EU, it's anti-democratic. But the there are people who point out that. Um, the, a referendum is not the only form of democracy that um, if there are people who didn't vote, uh, who are represented by their MPs in Parliament, that there are people who were prevented from voting. So the people who, in a, a way, are most directly affected by the UK leaving the EU, the three million EU citizens currently living in the UK, they, were, they weren't allowed to vote uh, in the referendum. So in those ways, you could say um, that through the exclusion of the EU citizens, the vote, it's, the referendum itself wasn't uh, democratic. And that the, the parliament thwarting the efforts to leave the EU is uh, democratic because it's the those MPs acting in the interests of their constituents and only a minority of the UK uh, population voted to leave the EU. Um, so there's actually three pe- sets of people. There are those people who voted to leave, those people who voted to remain and those people who didn't vote either because they weren't, uh, they hadn't made their minds up or um, because they were prevented from voting. So the Leave vote, the Leave campaigners have a point about the uh, anti-democratic nature of the EU and Remain supporters and campaigners have a point about the anti-democratic nature of the Leave, the Leave campaigners. Okay, so you're saying that certain claims that they, they make or on both sides are true or false. Um, you're not using right and wrong in the sense of politically correct or politically incorrect or morally uh, right or wrong. Um, so it's, yes, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I, I, have, I have a problem even discussing th- this issue in terms of democracy because, to me, a referendum is just not a democratic way of uh, decision-making. It's, it's just a way of manipulating the, the populace. And especially this, render, re, this referendum, which was clearly a false choice. It was a choice between, do you want the way things are now or something unspecified? Right. Of course, people will go for a future that could be anything. You could imagine it to be whatever you want it to be. And and now you guys are facing this. The consequences of this exactly what does leaving entail? And it doesn't seem to me that you're any closer to uh, an outcome regarding that. Um, so you know, people were offered a false choice in in a way that uh, really circumvented normal democratic procedures. You know, you you got a representative. Democracy. Democracy and, and that got undercut. Uh, so I, I, I just I, I I really don't even know why we're we're discussing this democracy issue. It looks to me like it's a um, tangential at, at best, and it's uh, 
um, it's a smokescreen at, at, at worst for what, what's really going on. I mean, the, what is what is in the interests of the world proletariat here? What is in the interest of humanity struggling for freedom? That, that's the terms in which I, I look at it. And it, it seems to me that the, the Brexit forces are, you know, reactionary. Um, they're xenophobic. Uh, this, if this stuff goes through, it's just one more nail in the coffin uh, of, you know, d- dividing the, the, the working class and the people struggling for freedom, dividing them along uh, national lines, dividing them along racial lines, and so forth, uh, dividing you conquer. So to me, it, it's it's just in terms of right and wrong, in terms of politically right and wrong, and morally right and wrong, it's just completely wrong. Uh, despite what anybody would, would, would say about referenda and democracy and, and all of this. So, um, you know, I wonder why why we, we, we have to get sucked into this discussion of, of, of the democracy I know I know, I know it's it's in the air people discuss it so but is there a way of moving beyond that kind of discourse that's a difficult question um I, I well I think you can't ignore the question of democracy because it is in, in the air and is the way that people are discussing what's going on in terms of what you've characterized as the uh, the racism and xenophobia um that was certainly a significant feature of the referendum campaign. Um, and it's inconceivable, as, as I see it, that the the referendum wouldn't have succeeded without pe- those people who were uh, anti-immigrant. But that's not the same thing as saying that um, the majority of those who voted to leave are anti-immigrant. Um, I'm not sure that that's the case. Um, and one of the reasons why I say that is because the immigration issue hasn't really been um, a, a big feature of the discussion since the, the referendum. You, you would think that if um, the driver of the, the Leave campaign was xenophobia and racism, then that would be something that would continue to be highlighted by the Leave campaign in the way that Trump has with the wall and with immigration in the US. But that's not been the case in the UK. UK. It's um, it's r- notable that even the Brexit Party, which uh, was formed by Nigel Farage, that uh, who was the leader of UKIP, that had the most uh, explicitly anti-migrant campaigning for years in the in the run-up to the referendum and then during the referendum, the, Bre- the Brexit Party don't make uh, an issue out of immigration in in their campaigning. So I think that um, I don't know whether it's it's that from the context of the US and the importance the, that the migration and racism has in, in US politics under Trump means that um, you're seeing are more sensitive to some of those aspects in the UK. But I think there's danger of reading it across as if it's the same thing, um, that it's, it's not um, an issue in the same way in the UK. And that's not to say there isn't uh, anti-immigrant hostility. There is. That isn't to say that the, um, the UK is the UK government is um, tough on immigration and immigrants. It is. I've been involved in campaigning for migrant rights for years, and uh, I can think of lots of uh, examples of ways in which the UK government is um, uh, callous in its approach to to migration. Um, and I know that there's uh, support for that amongst parts of the public. Um, but there's also recognition in the UK uh, amongst the public that uh, lots of aspects of uh, life in the UK would be adversely affected if we didn't have immigration. So there's a lot of people who uh, come into contact with uh, immigrants th- through their contact with the National Health Service. The the UK's National Health Service is reliant on uh, migrant nurses and doctors, surgeons, um, and uh, there's public support for uh, migrants coming to to work in hospitals in the UK, even amongst people who uh, think there are too many migrants coming to the UK. People do hold sometimes contradictory uh, ideas in their head, uh, two contradictory ideas at the same time. But but that that's uh, ways in which I think you, um, it's important not to to characterise the Leave vote as being a racist vote. <laughs> Hello.
Hello, this is Anne Jacquard, Organizational Secretary of Marxist Humanist Initiative. Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI, aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayevskaya. We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses whose emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marx's philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Today's political, economic, and environmental crises present a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible. We are distinguished by our economic analyses, which demonstrate that the only opposite to the current world economic system is its abolition and replacement with one not based on the production of, quote, value. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism, not socialism. MHI's ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interests separate and apart from theirs. We intend to practice, as well as espouse, a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice. There's another aspect to this which uh, I have written about, um, and that is the way in which the, those people who are on the left who support leave, uh, how many of them have not uh, challenged the racism on the leave side. Uh, they, they, they seem to think that uh, pointing out that there is racism on the leave side is an attempt to delegitimize the leave vote. Uh, whereas I think if they are willing to um, allow racism to go unchallenged, uh, then uh, they are not on the side of, of the working class anymore. They are uh, allowing divisions within the working class um, and they're, they're, yeah, they're condoning that and they're placing themselves on the side of those people who are uh, racist and xenophobic. Uh, where I do think there, there is division in the working class with Brexit is, is leave remain. The, the vote has divided the working class within the UK um, uh, and I, I do think from that point of view, Brexit is a, a real disaster in the way that it's divided up the working class. Do you think it's divided the working class in terms of we are British people, we are British workers, and those other people who come to our country or, or in other countries, they're different from us? I, I don't think it has in the sense that um, people who didn't think that before think it now. Um, I think it, there's, there is that constituency there uh, within the working class. Um, you know, hi historically, from the 19th century through the 20th century into the 21st century, there's always been um, a proportion of the working class in, in England and Scotland that are uh, hostile to, to immigration. So I, I don't think it's, it's new in that sense. I don't think that, uh, that Brexit has created that division, if, if that's what you're asking. No, I, I wasn't really thinking of that. I was just thinking of whether, um, first of all, if, if, if Brexit goes through, uh, it will have the effect of increasing an outlook in which people regard themselves as belonging to the nation. Um, and, you know, th so that 
the, the working people would be identifying with, with their bourgeoisie and whether the Brexit campaign uh, and, you know, propaganda associated with it has been narrowly nationalistic in that fashion, you know, like Britain for the British, it, it, whether it's directly about immigration or not. If it, in other words, it, it just take anti-EU sentiment it, is, is anti-EU sentiment in some sense, uh, you know, England first. Uh, there certainly is that, but I, I don't think it's reducible to that. Um, the uh, nationalism, national sentiment, uh, England first, Britain first, th- th- um, runs deep. Uh, you find it on the Remain side in the, the referendum. Um, you find it on the Remain side today. So the uh, David Cameron, who was the, the Prime Minister that... Um, enabled the, the referendum to happen and campaigned for the UK to remain, did it on the basis that this is in the best interest of Britain, that remaining in the EU uh, is best for us in terms of, of trade. Um, it's, so it's it, it, the remain side was conducted in, in nationalist terms. Uh, the, um, the, there isn't necessarily a, a, a contradiction between talking about Britain as a multicultural cosmopolitan society and talking about uh, putting British interests first. Chris, but aren't, aren't we able to say that one side of the Brexit issue is more reactionary than the other? Um, the, the difficulty I have with that is is the dividing things into sides as if the sides are um, internally unified. Right, but they are practically, practically speaking, they're only three sides. So they are internally unified in the sense that you pick a side and you're on that side. And we can understand the internal differentiation. Can't we still understand internal differentiation and still say there's an overall character to these sides? Our interest in this podcast and in Marxist Humanist Initiative, the organization which sponsors this podcast, is to uh, contribute ideas that are transformative, transformative in the sense uh, that they aid in the struggle against capitalism, that they aid in the struggle for universal emancipation of the working class and other oppressed peoples. And our aim is to show that these considerations are not just abstract or related just to some future events, but actually we can take these questions into consideration when talking about current events and the practical political choices that people have to make. And of course, when we're dealing with the immediate political situation, we're not always presented with choices or sides that are revolutionary or even close to being anti-capitalist. In the case of Brexit, we have three choices, leave with a deal, leave without a deal, remain, neither of which is particularly radical in itself. But that doesn't mean we have nothing to say about current events or that we, uh, our analysis is irrelevant. I mean, uh, the, the parallel with the U.S., I think, is that um, in the case of Trumpism, we were able to say, look, uh, the danger of Donald Trump is an extraordinary danger. Um, and that it's important to fight Trump and Trumpism at all costs, and that there can be no forward movement for, you know, freedom struggles in the U.S. when we are weighed down with the burden of authoritarianism and white nationalism and proto-fascism. Um, you know, in the case of Brexit, can we c- c- clearly say that one side is more reactionary than the other, or is there some? other type of analysis that we can put forward that can tell us, you know, where the um, sort of transformative space for struggle is within the Brexit struggles? There's several different things in what you've just said there, Brendan. Um, is about uh, what ideas can we contribute that are transformative? And there's the being faced with a practical choice in Brexit. And is there one side that's more reactionary than the other? Yeah. Um, if I I just take the second first second part, the more reactionary side. I, I those people I know who 
see something progressive in Brexit, say that um, a majority of working class people who voted voted to leave and those people um, are tired of a political elite that um, has just left them behind. And I think there's something in that. Um, the I think the, the, the problem is that distrust of politicians can go one of two ways. Um, it can go to, towards cynicism of politicians and an increasing uh, openness to authoritarian measures to get things done. Or it can go towards people saying, well, we can't trust politicians, we have to look to ourselves. And I think that after the vote, the uh, it became clear that those people who don't trust politicians, uh, by and large... Or don't trust themselves either. That the response is the the phrase that's been popularised is "get on with it." Right, we've told you what to do. Now get on with it. So it's this peculiar thing where um, cynicism about politicians and lack of trust of politicians ends up looking to politicians. And I think that's the underlying problem with the Leave side is that um, there isn't something there that's gone in a progressive direction. So that distrust of politicians hasn't uh, gone uh, in the direction of those people saying, so um, politicians don't care about uh, the working class in Britain. We need to take control of things for ourselves. Whereas on the Remain side, um, the there are more progressive uh, elements there. Uh, and those progressive elements have shown themselves in... Um, in the aftermath of the the, the referendum, um, so people who have been saying that it's clear that um, the the referendum threw up all sorts of issues that we hadn't anticipated uh, when people voted that there should be a second referendum uh, in order to um, to vote in again in light of what we now know that we didn't know before. Uh, I think that's something positive because it's holding on to the notion of uh, democracy, that it should be the people that decide, um, but saying that uh, people should decide in a context where they're informed about the decision. Um, I think there was complacency on the part of those people who are in favour of migrant rights before the election, sorry, before the referendum, because uh, the assumption was that the referendum wasn't going to um, uh, result in uh, the UK leaving the, the EU. And we didn't look closely at some of the details and um, didn't make enough out of the fact that in advance of the referendum itself, that three million people were being dis disenfranchised through this vote. After the, the referendum, much more has been made of that, That um, which is unfortunate that it, it wasn't so upfront beforehand because it means that some people on the Leave side can characterise it as um, sour grapes and just trying to undermine the, the vote. But I think that... Um, I think that the issue of migration is one that um, clearly was being used by the Leave side as a xenophobic issue in the, the campaign for the referendum. And it was... Uh, so those people on the Remain side who kick back against that, uh, that's something progressive, and saying um, that, uh, that, uh, we should be opposed to uh, the Leave vote because they're stirring up xenophobia. Then after the the referendum took place, um, those people who have been arguing uh, on the, the pro-migrant side uh, have been those people who've been more likely to, to uh, call for the UK to remain in the EU, uh, whether um, by overturning Article 50 or whether by, uh, but more, more commonly by demanding a second referendum. Um, and I think they're, they're right to point out that the exclusion of uh, three million EU citizens from being able to vote was anti-democratic. Um, they're right to point out that um, 
Brexit is dividing the working class in the campaign and um, subsequently after the, the referendum in the way that uh, migrants are being presented as a, a, a problem in British society. Um, I think that um, the that that's been much more the uh, uh, the pro migrant arguments have been much more on the the remain side than on the the leave side of the argument. There have certainly been people on the remain side who are have little regard for democracy. They would be happy to just overturn the uh, the referendum result without consulting the people. But uh, the more progressive voices, the more progressive arguments, they have been mainly on the Remain side. Um, so the arguments that um, the Leave vote was anti-democratic, xenophobic, because it was based on anti-migrant arguments, I think that's undeniable. That it was xenophobic and undemocratic because it excluded three million EU citizens who live in the UK from having uh, a say. I think that's that's uh, absolutely true as well, um, and those people who have argued that um, we should be trying to uh, defend the rights of migrants uh, in the UK uh, today and not drive a wedge between EU migrants and migrants from the rest of the world, uh, which has been a, a tendency on the part of some on the Remain side. It's they want to defend free move movement within the EU rather than migrants as such. Um, so I think those those progressives have been on the Remain side, even while they are critical of the EU. So those people who are uh, in favour of migrant rights in the UK, who are uh, hostile towards and opposed to the Leave side, uh, recognise and will point out that the EU uh, is fortress Europe and uh, is anti-migrant uh, in the Mediterranean and the, the policies it's pursuing there. But certainly the, the more progressive looking out for the interests of the international working class rather than uh, looking at uh, class issues in nationalistic terms, uh, they have been on the Remain side. Um, and in terms of then the, the first part of the question, what ideas can we contribute that are transformative of capitalism? I think um, upholding the idea that the, the working class is international rather than uh, based on national lines is a really important thing to do. Um, there are some on the left in the UK who say that um, in order to be internationalist, we have to defeat our own ruling class first, that idea of uh, revolutionary defeatism. And they're using that argument to um, support leave. I think that's just missing out completely. It's a, it's a disingenuous argument. It's, it's missing out completely on the way in which um, the Leave campaign divided the working class, uh, both uh, rhetorically and uh, in practice, and the way in which um, the, the UK treats um, the migration issue, um, where migrants, even those people who are uh, uh, in favour of leaving and are pro-migrant, subordinate migrants to the interests of the British economy. That's the way in which they look at it. Um, so we'll have migrants come as long as they're able to contribute something to Britain, looking at it in nationalistic terms rather than in class terms. Um, so in favour of, of migrants against uh, xenophobia, against uh, nationalist thinking, I think those are things that we can contribute that are transformative of capitalism. And I think that um, arguing for a second referendum is something that's important to do because the um, one of the strongest arguments that the Leave side feel they have in their armory is that this is a democratic vote. I think having a second referendum will take that away. Uh, it, won't, it won't stop some people from talking about betrayal or talking about uh, it's anti-democratic, uh, a second referendum, but it does um, cut the ground from under that argument and uh, make it more difficult one to sustain. Um, right. Well, that's all the time we have on the podcast today. Thank you again to Chris Gilgan for joining us. 
Please stop by MarxistHumanistInitiative.org to listen to more episodes, and please leave a comment. We always are looking for comments and discussion about these topics.